In this video, I'm going to talk about biohacking. What are a couple of definitions on biohacking? What's the definition I think suits the best? And what is actually the impact of biohacking? So what is biohacking? I collected a couple of examples in popular media where they use the term biohacking. For example, it's a symbiosis of man and machine to change the environment and the surroundings for optimal and peak performance. It's the use of biology, technology and systems thinking to live an optimal life. It's tinkering with the human body. So there are a lot of definitions, sentences, explanations of the term biohacking. But I'm here to categorize the three major schools of thought concerning biohacking. These are do-it-yourself biology. The second group is so-called lifestyle optimizers. And the third group are the radical biohackers. So the first group, I like to call them do-it-yourself biologists or do-it-yourself biotechnologists. And the reason I start with this group or school of thought or this category, if, as you might call it, is because they are the oldest group. Because in 1989, there was an article in the Washington Post about the so-called biohackers. And the article described a group of amateur biologists or amateur biotechnologists that were working in their kitchen sink on biotechnology. And the article made the distinction, or I should say the analogy with computer hackers. Because computer hackers, they were also gathering around in so-called hacker spaces, where they discussed and worked on hardware, on software. And in the article in the Washington Post, they saw the same phenomenon arise with biotechnology. So the computer hackers have like hacker spaces and now you have biohacker spaces or some kind. And they use the term because the use of biotechnology at that time certainly was mostly done in research facilities or at big pharmaceutical companies, etc. And the term hacking implies that you can now do it a lot more for a lot less money and also you don't need like the actual degrees or high and fancy equipment. You can also build your equipment yourself. Well, a great moment for this category or as you might call it was with the start of the wet lab, open wet lab BioCurious. BioCurious started in San Francisco and they also ran a Kickstarter campaign about that. And in the Netherlands, you have a couple of wet labs, maybe also in your country. Uh, in the Netherlands, you have, for example, the open wet lab at De Waag, and that's where I also finished my course of the Biohack Academy. So the first group are the amateur biotechnologists or the do-it-yourself biologists. And what kind of resembles the people that come together in these kinds of spaces are that they're actually working, their daytime work is actually as a biotechnologist at a pharmaceutical company, or maybe they're also doing research in academia, but they do not have the space to experiment with biotechnology in their work. So they go to an open wet lab at night. There are also lay people just like me who go to these wet labs to experiment and try biotechnology, for example, do genetic analysis or maybe work with, on a PCR machine. And a third group within this category are bio artists. They also like to use these hacker spaces, bio hacker spaces to also work on their bio art. The second category are the so-called lifestyle optimizers. And these people try with self-experimentation to see if they can increase their own performance. So they're striving for peak performance. And some people in these fields are, some prominent figures I should say, are Tim Ferriss, Dave Esprit, Rhonda Patrick and Timo Arena. 
Tim Ferriss, for example, he wrote a couple of books. He is now also a very famous podcast host. But he wrote a book, for example, The 4-Hour Body. And actually, that was also for me the start of doing experimentations with myself. Because Tim Ferriss was doing experimentations how he could increase his muscles or also increase his focus or learn a new language very fast. The second example I gave for the second figurehead is Dave Asprey. He's the founder and also the prominent person on the brand Bulletproof. He's now not a CEO anymore. But he also invented the Bulletproof coffee. And Bulletproof coffee is something that a lot of people in this category like. This is where you make your coffee, then you add some butter and MCT oil. Then you put it in a blender and that's your breakfast drink and a lot of claims about the advantage of drinking bulletproof coffee in the morning which i will not get into today and when i talk about this a lot of people are really disgusted by this but i should mention it actually tastes better than it just sounds so that's dave sp the other example is timo arena he's a finnish guy and he's also the curator of the yearly biohacker summits in Stockholm, Helsinki uh, and also some other places and he's also the founder of Biohacker Center. He also wrote a book with two Finnish colleagues on biohacking and he's also more in the lifestyle optimizing part but also with the use of technology. And the last example is Rhonda Patrick although she not really mentioned the term biohacking a lot She's a scientist, this, are, this is looking at how to increase your longevity, your health, etc. So these are all examples of prominent people within this domain of biohacking. And some other techniques besides using drinking bulletproof coffee are the use of uh, gadgets like for example smart rings or sports watches or all kinds of technology to measure your own health. Um, some other lifestyle techniques are also intermittent fasting, for example, where you don't, do not eat for a couple of hours, uh, but also taking ice baths. So maybe you heard about the Wim Hof method, for example. And these are all elements which you can use, which are also some claims if it's beneficial or not. And the question is if it's, if it's also founded on scientific research, but these are all methods within the second group of lifestyle optimizers. The third group are the so-called radical biohackers. And to make things even more easy for you, I divide this group in two groups again, called the radical biohackers, like the genetic modifiers and the cyborgs. And to start with the first one, the genetic modifiers, these are people that you can kind of link them to the first category of the do-it-yourself biotechnologists and they use genetic modification techniques and other biotechnology technologies uh, that's an easy word uh, to use them themselves so if you're interested there's a great documentary on netflix called a natural selection which also some key figures in this domain are Josia zaner and tristan roberts and they say well we do not have to use genetic modification and other technologies only for healthcare or in pharmaceutical companies or for maybe enhanced crops or livestock etc why would we also use it to change ourselves so these are the do-it-yourself genetic modifiers another group are and i think they're also the most the best usage or you can see them a lot in popular media are the cyborgs and the cyborgs are looking at biohacking like you can also change the human body by putting electronics in it. So in a way, you're augmenting the human body. And examples in this field are an English professor, Kevin Warwick, uh, but also Tim Cannon, uh, who has also all kinds of implants in his body. And also Neil Harbinson. Neil Harbinson is a cyborg artist and he now has a skull implant in which he can hear colors. So these are a couple of examples of the so-called cyborgs. In one of the later videos in another module, I get more into detail about the different forms of implants. 
My personal preference is in the third group. So I have experience with all the three of the categories because I started with lifestyle optimization, doing all kinds of experiments to see if I can increase my own performance. I did a course at the Biohack Academy. So I was also doing things in the first domain of do-it-yourself biology. And I'm also following that field still. But now my interest is actually at the third group, the cyborgs and also the do-it-yourself genetic modifiers, which I call the radical biohackers. Because I think that will have the most impact on our future, where we can really augment, change, improve and upgrade the human body. So what's the impact of biohacking? I give you a couple of examples. What's interesting about biohacking is, of course, the use of the term hacking. And that's where the computer analogy comes in. Because a lot of people say, well, just like we were hacking into computers, which led to all kinds of innovations like the internet and all kinds of apps and software developments, we now can also look at the human body as a sort of computer and hack into it. Uh, so some people go really far by putting electronics in it. And some people, like in the second category of lifestyle optimizers, they say, well, when you're doing intermittent fasting or drinking bulletproof coffee or do you do other lifestyle hack, you're also hacking into the computer. And what's interesting is that also Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, he was interviewed a couple of years ago by a magazine, uh, Wired, about his old days as a computer hacker. And they asked Bill, hey Bill, what would you do if you were young right now? And what's interesting is that Bill said, well, I would not be hacking into computers. I don't know if this is Bill Gates, his accent, by the way, but I would be hacking into biology because biology is, are the bi biology is the building blocks of life. So that's interesting. So Bill Gates is also using the computer analogy. But the use of a computer as a metaphor, it's actually not that strange. To illustrate that, I will give you a couple of historical examples. The ancient Greeks, they were doing a lot of with waterways and irrigations and aqueducts, etc. And they also had the law of humorous, which means that the health of a human body is also dependent on a balance or a disbalance in four bodily fluids. So there you can already see the resemblance. And during the time of Descartes at the Renaissance, they were working on clocks and watches, etc. And it also led René Descartes to think of the human brain as like the inner workings of a clock. And even later, during the Industrial Revolution, people were also looking at the human body as a consulate of pipes and steam, etc. And even later with the invitation of electricity, we also got sayings from the time. For example, oh, there's really tension between us, or I need to really, uh, there's electricity in the air, and I really need to recharge, for example. And now, we are in the computer technology, in internet technology. So that's also where our resemblance with computers comes from. So it's not that strange that we use the term biohacking because it's also derived from hacking into computers. But what's another example of the impact of biohacking is where I zoom in on the three categories again. So think about the first group, the do-it-yourself biotechnologists. They are really looking to open source biotechnology materials, machines, and also the use of these genetic materials, etc. So in a way, they all want to also to open source, cooperate on this field. And it could have, of course, the same impact like Linux or Bitcoin or Wikipedia had when people were using started to work on information technology together. And I think the second category also had a major impact. Well, because more and more people are actually looking into their own health and tracking and monitoring their own health and using all kinds of technology and also are more aware of 
prevention. So what can they do with their lifestyle, with their diets, with taking certain supplements yeah, to keep their body healthy for a longer period of time. So this, this will also, I think, impact the healthcare institutions in a major way. But I think the third category, my personal favorite of the radical biohackers, will have the most impact on our world, especially the technologies that are involved, like genetics, neurotechnology, implants, etc. Because that can lead to an all different fields of Homo sapiens, where maybe we can upgrade to become another species. So in all these domains and all these schools of thought, it can have a major impact on our future. Another example on the impact of biohacking is the work of Gartner. Gartner is a research company and they publish every year their influential hype cycle. And at the end of 2018, the term biohacking first made the top 10 of Gartner. And I'd like to read a quote from the report. 2018 is just the beginning of a transhuman age where hacking biology and extending humans will increase popularity and availability. This range from simple diagnostics to neuro implants and be subject to legal and societal questions about ethics and humanity. These biohacks will fall into four categories. Well, I will mention the categories later, but what's interesting there, this is a pretty broad term and you also heard transhuman. So I will get in a later video talk about transhumanism, which I feel is really something in extension of biohacking, but it's actually something different. So what are these categories? Gardner made a distinction between technological augmentation, nutri-genomics, experimental biology, and grinder technology. So technological augmentation is where on the video on human augmentation, I will dive deep into what is the use of technology to augment your senses or your capabilities, etc. The field of nutri-genomics is where you use genetic information to change your diets, etc. So you really have like a DNA-based diet or DNA-based food, etc. Experimental biology is actually kind of resembles the first category, which I mentioned about the do-it-yourself biotechnologists. And the fourth category is about the so-called grinders. And if you paid attention, you know that's the radical biohackers, the cyborgs in my field. So in Garner, they had a broad definition of biohacking where they contain all these elements inside of it. But I hope that you are aware by watching this video that there are actually some different paths and also some different directions in which this technology actually originates and also where they continue on to the future. So to conclude, there are different definitions on biohacking. And I think the second group or second category, which is about radical improvement of the human body or radical altering of the human body, will have the most impact on our world. But that does not mean that the other categories are not important. Because people are, are using more and more technology to track their own health and are doing more and more things to stay healthy for a longer period of time. And also because biotechnology gets more affordable and accessible, you can also see a rise of open source development and collaboration in that field. And I talked about the major impact biohacking will have on our future. Will it be the computer analogy like by Bill Gates or the examples I just gave? And also that major research companies and consulting companies like Gartner are also looking into biohacking as one of the major technological trends for the coming years. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my channel and also if you have a question or a remark, leave a comment down below. Go to my website if you want to have a free download and if you are interested in more in-depth knowledge and know-how about human enhancement, human augmentation, biohacking and the superhuman era.